So I'm Walter Bodmer. I'm based in Oxford and an emeritus professor at Oxford University. And amongst my major interests has been the study of population genetics, the study of genetic variation in populations that can tell us so much about them and how different subgroups of populations relate to each other. And that's what my talk's about. And it uh, refers to blood because blood is the source uh, of a lot of the variation that one studies. And in particular, it contains the white cells, which have the DNA on the basis of which we do our studies. Hello, and a very warm welcome to the fifth lecture in the 2021 Darwin College Lecture Series. Today, we've reached the halfway mark in our series of eight lectures on blood. We began with a vivid description of the battles involved in combating blood cancer from Professor Claire Rohde. This was followed by Sarah Reed's historic discourse on the interplay between the physiological, social and cultural factors relating to transitional bleeding. At the start of February, Professor Tim Pedley explained the fluid mechanics of blood flow and last week, Professor Carol Senf offered her insights into Stoker's novel Dracula and what it conveys about the feminist ideal of the new woman. These lectures are all available online now, so if you missed any of them or want to see them again, please do go to our college YouTube channel. This week, we move to examine bloodlines. Our speaker tonight is Professor Sir Walter Bodmer. Currently, he is head of the Cancer and Immunogenetics Laboratory in the Wetherill Institute for Molecular Medicine at the University of Oxford. Sir Walter began his career studying mathematics here at Cambridge, where he also obtained a PhD in population genetics, studying the house mouse and the plant, the primrose. Following postdoctoral studies in Stanford, he returned to the UK to become the first professor of genetics at the University of Oxford. And he went on to lead the Imperial College Research Fund to serve as Chancellor of Salford University and Principal of Hartford College, among many other roles. He was one of the first people to propose the Human Genome Project and has, through his long and illustrious career, made an extraordinary contribution to the public understanding of science, something that's never been more important than it is today, given the global pandemic that surrounds us. This evening, Sir Walter will share the results of his groundbreaking study to characterize the genetic makeup of the British population and relate it to the historical and archeological evidence in his lecture entitled, Bloodlines of the British. So my talk is on the bloodlines of the British. And what do we mean by that? We mean by where the British come from. And we talk about blood because that's the source of how we can get at the genetic information, which is on the red cells, and especially through the white cells, which are our sources of, of DNA. Now, I imagine that most of you have given a blood transfusion at some time, given blood for a transfusion or you may even have had a blood transfusion, and you'll know that that doesn't work unless, unless your blood is matched to the blood of the person to whom you're giving it, the donor. Uh, and that's because there are genetic differences on the surface of the red cells that are such that if you give the wrong type of blood to someone, it'll do harm. And these differences were found in a very simple way by Landstein in 1900, because he found if you took the blood of one person and mixed it with someone else, you often found these clumps of cells that showed that there was something in their blood that was bringing them together that was different when if you mix the blood of, the, uh, of that sort, which doesn't do anything. And this clumping is because these people have an antibody, something that recognizes something on the surface of the red cell that clumps them together. Uh, so an anti-A is produced here. And so the person who has the A type will react to, to, to people who have anti-A and anti-B and they're called O. And the person who has an A-type serum 
will have an anti-B and they won't react to someone who's error. So in this way, you define the ABO blood types. And you know, the ABO differences, they're simply inherited by the rules that we now know were determined by Mendel. But it was only 10 years, not until 10 years after they were discovered, that Dungan and, and Hertzfeld showed that they were actually inherited in a simple way. And they had the idea that perhaps if there's this sort of genetic variability, differences between people, that you could study different populations and see if the frequencies of these types varied from one population to another. And they took advantage of the opportunity to study a large number of people after the end of the, or during the First World War by, by using people who were involved in the war. And they classified people into whether they were English, French, Italian, Austrian, and at the other end, Indian uh, and Negro, we wouldn't use that term now, Africans and so on. And then they typed them. They said, how many are type A and how many are type B? The two types that Landsteiner had found. And what they found is that there was variation from one population to another in this frequency of the B type. So that here the English had a very low frequency of B and a lot of A. Whereas if you went to the Indians, they had a huge frequency of B and much less of A. So here was an example, the first example of how the genetic variation was telling you something about the different populations and where people came from. And actually the Hertzfeld thought that the whole of the human species was divided into the A's and the B's, which is a strange idea. Um, which of course can't be true because we're only looking at one small part of what's inherited. Well, the, the red blood cells, because they're easily accessible to a blood sample, were the source of finding a number of other genetic differences that we call blood groups on the surface of red cells. And at a time when a number of these had been put together, um, two colleagues and good friends of mine, Luca Cavalli Sforzo, at one time was in Cambridge and Anthony Edwards, who's an emeritus professor of Cambridge University, had the idea that maybe you could use these genetic differences now for several of them and use the frequencies with which they occurred in different populations as a sort of measure of the characteristic of the population. The more similar the frequencies were, the more likely the peoples uh, who, who had those similar frequencies came from similar areas. And so you can see at the top, the Australians, the native Australians and the New Guineans come together. Here people uh, from Africa come together and the Swedish and the Europeans in the middle. So they used this, just this very limited amount of information at that time to put together this picture, the evolutionary tree of human populations. And it was the first time that was done. And it was really quite remarkable how much information it already gave that matched up with what we think is the history of these different populations and whether some are more distantly related to each other uh, than others are. But there again, the, the blood groups, what you find on the surface of the red cells are a limited source of information. Uh, and the white cells in the blood, they are cells that are much more like other cells in the body because they have DNA in them. Uh, and they have a much wider range of differences that you can study by looking in a sense for these types of blood groups, but on the white cells instead of the red cells. And people were very interested in doing this because they felt if you did that, then you can match people for transplantation. I'm sure many of you will know that rather like blood transfusion won't work if you don't match the ABO types. You couldn't take a piece of, take a piece of my skin and put it onto someone else and it would survive, it will be rejected because we all differ with respect to a range of genetic variation that is very considerable, that makes us recognize the foreign uh, transplant, if you will, as something different. So it was with that in mind that people studied the white cells for blood group type things, and they found something extraordinary and very variable. So each of these uh, letters or numbers is equivalent to one of those, like just A or B. But uh, you have different genes giving rise to different sets of these. And these are all different types, all different types determined by a different version of the gene for A or B or, or, or C. And, and similarly, uh, the, these other types. So there's a, a whole range of these um, 
differences, huge numbers now in the hundreds, which vary in this way. And that's why it's so difficult to find unrelated people who are matched for these types. But they also provide an extraordinary range of variability uh, that you can study again, rather like uh, the blood groups were used, but on a much larger scale. Now, there's another thing to point out in this, that uh, these, these blood types are all inherited. Our genes are strung next to each other on the chromosomes. And when they're very close together, they're held together in the family. So actually, this is one of my chromosomes coming from one of my parents carrying the six different types determined by G, these six different genes. And they're all inherited together as a clump. So within a family, within a family, on the whole, on the average, there'll only be four different combinations. This one with one from the mother, this one from the other from the mother and so on, the four different combinations. So there's a chance of just a quarter of finding someone with exactly the same type. And that's why bone marrow transplants are carried out between um, brothers and sisters who have the same HLA types, which you can find. But when you go beyond that unrelated, uh, you don't find that. So here you have this huge range of variation. Now we know now that because of its role in transplant rejection, as I've just mentioned, it has something to do with the immune system, the way the body reacts to uh, foreign infections or to a virus infection, which we're all rather too familiar with at the moment. And so there was an argument for looking to see whether these HLA types had any influence on a type of disease that's called an autoimmune disease, where the body's immune system reacts to its own tissues and does damage. So studies were started, which had been thought about for the ABO types, but not so obviously involved. So people looked in a very simple way and said, are there any of these types that are found with a higher frequency in people with a disease than not? And just look at this ankylosing spondylitis, a sort of rather nasty rheumatic disease of the spine where the, uh, the spines, uh, <coughs> they all stick together and you have a, a stiff back and it's very unpleasant. It's not lethal, but it's unpleasant. And they found that nearly 90% or more of people with ankylosing spondylitis with this disease carried this particular type B27, which you can just type for uh, like, like any other type. And in the population at large, there were less than 10%. So this was a strong indication that this particular genetic variant had something to do with that susceptibility disease. And you see, this was true for other diseases, psoriasis of the skin, um, uh, celiac disease. Many people are familiar with this. That's gluten sensitivity, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, an inflammatory disease that gives you to inflamed joints. And in each case, there was a particular type more common in the people with disease than those without it. And in each case, that said something about what might be the genetic control of that disease. Uh, and is it something to do with the immune system? The only one that wasn't to do with the immune system was this one. Hemochromatosis, a disease connected with accumulation of iron in the blood in an, uh, a way. And it turned out that that was explained in a very uh, interesting way to be something due to a different gene, not the actual gene we were typing for. Now, to take this a step further, I, I want to talk about a phenomenon that has the ugly name of linkage disequilibrium. Uh, and what that means is that when genes are close together, like the A and the B genes, and you can be type A for one version of your gene and B8 for the other, then if they were independent, the simple rules of independence would say, well, if that's the frequency of type A and that of type B8, um, then uh, you'd expect A1 and B8 together to be just the product of those two frequencies, about 2%. But what's actually observed is 7%, which is nearly three times as big. And that difference is what's called linkage disequilibrium. And the reason is that because these genes tend to be associated and in inherited together a bit like they are in the family, but even at the population level. And that's a very important phenomenon to take into account because that says that when you use the frequencies of A1 and B8, you not only can get the information from the frequency of each type, 
but also with the extent to which it's held together by this linkage disequilibrium. The other thing it says to you, supposing you found that A1 was associated with a disease and you hadn't looked at B8, B8 could be the cause of that disease because it's associated with A1. So actually looking at the frequencies of these genetic variations in diseases can be a very interesting way of finding out what might be genetic contributing factors, inherited factors contributed to these diseases. And that's become a major way of studying any genetic variation. You have just have the genetic variation. You say, is it more frequent in someone with a disease, with diabetes or whatever the disease was, or for instance, who has an allergy. I have an allergy that's associated with a particular one of these types. And so that made it interesting to say, well, perhaps we should know more about the frequencies of these types in a normal population. Because to do study like that, you've got to compare the frequency in the diseased with non-diseased people. But it's no good doing that if the non-diseased people don't come from essentially the same population. So for that reason, it was that the Wellcome Trust, who are a major medical research charity supporting um, uh, medically related studies, were willing to support a detailed study of the British population of their genetics because it would provide a resource for future studies of disease associations. So they funded uh, me and a group of colleagues uh, to do this study. And the, the study we did was to collect samples, blood samples, which gave us the DNA through the white cells from all over the UK. But we were very keen to do it in a particular way. We wanted to get samples from people who in a way represented the two British population, which I certainly don't. I was born in Germany and half Jewish and what knows else. And I'm not typically British, but there are lots of people who are. And one way to look at that is to say, well, let's at least say that all their grandparents should come from roughly the same area. Then you would get rid of, of a lot of the local uh, movements that came as particularly with, with the Industrial Revolution. So we collected samples and then we collected them from country areas, rural areas, where the populations are much less mixed up than they are if you go to a big city. So we had this aim then of collecting samples in the rural areas from people all of whose grandparents came from the same area. And in the end, we analyzed uh, just over 2000 people defined in that way with very careful assessment of where they came from. And instead of just using a few things, nowadays with DNA, we have something like three million letters worth, you know, the DNA letters go in four letters, A, T, G, and C, and we have three billion of them in our whole genome, the whole chromosome set. And about one in a thousand vary just between any two individuals. And some of those variations are much more frequent than others, and we call those SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms. So we analyzed more than half a million of these differences that gave us this frequency spectrum that tells us how one group of people may be different uh, on average genetically from the others. And then we used uh, uh, an approach to this analysis which takes account of where these are in the way I explained for the HLA type. So in a sense, we created a genetic map of the British Isles, which was a resource for future disease studies. So how did we go about that? How do you recruit people like that? Well, it's not all that easy. You use all sorts of local media. We went to different parts of the country. We got the local newspapers, television. We got the family history societies, genealogical societies, all possible sorts of, of, of resources where we might encourage people who are interested in their ancestry to come and, and give us a blood sample. But actually, we didn't have difficulty doing that. We'd sometimes go to a town and walk up and down the high street and tell people what we were doing. And there's a huge interest in people ha having an interest in their own ancestry. So we did that throughout the country. And here's an example. We, we set ourselves up to collect the information uh, this is uh, Tammy, who was one of the main people who organized things first, along with Bruce. Um, that's my wife, and that's a daughter, not uh, <coughs> her stepdaughter. And so we set ourselves up in this way in, in a parish hall or, or whatever 
uh, accommodation we could get paying a minimal amount of money and had people come and take the information from them, take a blood sample, which we then used uh, for finding out how they differed at the DNA level. Um, so this is a picture where each dot corresponds to the average place of where their grandparents were born. And remember, we tried to get them so that their grandparents were born within a sort of 80 kilometer um, range of each other. So you might wonder why there are some people in the sea here. That's because not all were successful. And these could have been um, grandparents, some of whom came from Ireland and some of whom came from here and so on. But you'll see that we covered the country quite well. And where there are gaps like here, that's because it's London and we didn't take samples from London because we went to the rural areas. And Scotland looks sparse, but as a proportion of Scotland, we got quite a lot. And we focused for various reasons on Orkney because actually a study that we did in Orkney, which led to a television program many years ago, was what in a way stimulated what we were doing here. So here we have these samples from all over the UK. We have the genetic information. And now what do we do with it? What we try and do with it, we try and find out who are the people who are most similar to each other with respect to all this genetic variation. And can we cluster them? Can we put together in one group the people who are most similar to each other and somewhat different from the others and then build up a picture of these sorts of groups? Now, there are various ways of doing this, and I mentioned here that we use this uh, so-called approach of, of fine structure analysis that takes into account gene positions. And these are the size of the different clusters that we found of people who are similar to each other. But just to show what happens if you don't take into account this phenomenon that we call linkage disequilibrium of how genes are together and only use the frequencies of the genes on their own, then when you use a very standard way in which this had been done before called principal components, which essentially tries to pull out of the data, data the variation that matters most, you, you get a very confused picture. So you can plot each of these individuals is again someone plotted on the basis of these two components as they're called. And, and we know that this actually is the Orkney population that's the North Wales, that's the South Wales. And it's all rather mixed up there. You can't tell anything really, apart from the most obviously large differences. But when you analyze it properly, taking into account the position of the genes, you get this. Now, frankly, when we found this, it was an enormous surprise. And it's the fundamental basis of a lot of what I'm gonna to talk to you about. So we're gonna spend some time saying, well, what is all this? So each of these symbols, the, the, the yellow circles, a pink circle, uh, a red square, and so on. Uh, first of all, each single symbol represents a single individual and where we place them on the map by very careful assessment of where they came from. And the combination of color and symbol indicates people who belong to the same group together by the similarity of their genetics. So this is one. Uh, this is one group that say together, this is another, this is another, this is another. Now, the remarkable thing is, we didn't place these on the map because they were neat to each other. We placed them on the map because they were similar to each other genetically. So this map is based entirely on the genetic similarity. So when you get a cluster of people in, in more or less the same place with the same colored symbol, Yes, they do come from that place, but that's not the reason we put them there. The reason we put them there is because they were similar genetically. So we get this extraordinary information that tells us about different groups of people based on the genetic variation we can study with those half million places along the genome where there is variation and can analyze. Uh, and it's, it tells us a lot as I'm gonna keep on in the first, what I say now, um, telling you about. And the way I'm going to do this is we can say, well, let's start with the group that initially was the most different from everyone else in the British population. And I've already given you a clue what that means. Well, you can guess, it was Orkney. It's an island that was a, 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 a Norse kingdom for a, 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 something like four or 500 years. So you might expect 
that the Norse Vikings introduced something there more than in elsewhere, and that that's why it's very different from the others. Um, and so we can go down that 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 list and and look for the the what comes next. So after the Orkneys stand out as most different from the others, what's the next most different group? Before we do that, I should tell you a little story. We had the surnames of the people. Now, as you probably know, surnames are often characteristic of where people come from. Uh, and there's a, a colleague in, in university college who, who has, uh, Paul Longley, who has a, um, a, a program called Surname Profiler, where you can look up any surname that occurs more than 100 times and say, where was it mainly in, in an 1881 census? And where was it in 1998? And if you take this surname, Rendell, which if you go into the wonderful cathedral <coughs> and the capital of Orkney, you, you'll see uh, uh, the, the names on, on, on gravestones. There's a very common name in Orkney. And look at this, Jack Rendell. In 1881, that name was nearly only in Orkney and in the northeast corner of Scotland. And even a hundred years later, it was still there. Didn't move around that much. Of course, there will be people with the work in London and cities, but this is where the main focus of it is. And, and that's where we'd expect to find the Rendell. But actually, it was quite interesting because oh, if he was really a Norse type, he should have had a particular chromosome type uh, variant that we find on the Y chromosome that's common in the Norse, and he had that. But actually, he looked a bit more ancient British than Norse, so he was a bit of a mixture. And that, that we can tell things like that, even from looking at individuals. So now let's go on. Where's the next biggest difference? Now you can see that very easily by the change in color. So the next biggest difference are North and South Wales, which again was a surprise to us, that the Welsh are the most different from the rest of Great Britain, the, the island of Great Britain. Um, and and that, was, that was quite striking. Um, to us that they were the next most common. Uh, and again, there's a story here. So we had an individual, we were allowed with individuals, if we were doing it for television program, we could tell people that we were gonna take and tell them what their genetic makeup was. So here was a guy whose initials were DH. And I'm not gonna tell you right away what that stood for, but look at the distribution of his name. 1881, where is it? North Wales particularly North Wales, spread it around a bit. Where is it a hundred years later? It's more or less in the same place, same area. It's extraordinary, I mean, that there's much less movement around than people think. Now, this guy, we could tell from our genetics at the time that he was more than 20 times as likely to be from a Welsh population than the Anglo-Saxon populations, which you'd find towards East Anglia. And that fitted together remarkably well. And what was his name? David Hughes. Have you ever heard of a more Welsh name than that? So there is a match up there, even at that sort of simple minded level between what we find in the people uh, and what we find in the genetics. So if we go on to that, the next stage, again, is very interesting. First of all, we separate North and South Wales. They're as different as many groups within the main parts uh, of Great Britain. And we also separate from the first time Cornwall down at the bottom here. And, and that's interesting because people have always thought of the Celtic fringe, you know, going from Cornwall through Wales up through Scotland as a sort of uh, common entity. But it suggests that it's not that simple and that, that will come up later. And then in addition, what we find is we're beginning to separate out the Scots from the North English. See, these are all the Scots here, and that's the boundary. So we're getting a, a picture here that, that fits in with the different subpopulations that we find in, in the UK, uh, a, according to where people were born. Now, what's the next thing we find? You just have to look carefully to see what changes. Look at what changes there. What changes? One is the color at the top. You get this blue, which starts distinguishing uh, parts of Ireland and the, North, the Highlands of Scotland 
and the lowlands of Scotland. And you get a break here in Orkney. And it's interesting that that actually, those differences in Orkney, where this is Westray, it's one of the northern islands of Orkney that has that green on it. Um, we saw fairly early on that the people from Westray looked as though they were a bit different from the others. And that's one of the things that gave us the clue. Perhaps if we did this sort of study, we could find this type of genetic map of variation. And then you see another difference here. These are the Welsh borders. And they're sort of between the Welsh people and the rest of the country. This is a large, big group on its own. And see something else that suddenly comes up, Devon and Cornwall. And isn't that remarkable? If you know Cornwall the way I do, I've got a flat somewhere near there, just by Plymouth. It's just there. That's the boundary. There's hardly anyone in Cornwall who shouldn't be there and hardly anyone in Devon who shouldn't be there. They're not mixed up there. You get the occasional person outside, which is interesting because that must have meant that in some way the family moved together. So what's the next difference? So you, you, each time you have to look at what happens there. There's a very interesting thing that happens there. Just look for here at the moment, just look at Wales there, see that? That's a difference between North and South Pembrokeshire. And I'm gonna talk about that later. It's sometimes called Little England Beyond Wales. And I'm gonna talk about that a bit more later to see how that fits with some of the known history. And you see also that um, you've got a, a, a Scottish group that's come up here as separate from the rest of the Scottish group, you see? And, and that's sort of somewhere around Aberdeen and around there. And then what happens next? Now you see another interesting difference. Just look to see what, what colours come up that are different. One let of colours is that these people in, that have something genetically in common between Northern Ireland and Scotland, you now get a subgroup that's more related to the Highlands and an Irish subgroup that's more related to the Lowlands. You split up these groups and this actually becomes part of West Yorkshire. And you st start splitting these up into Cumbria on the west and, and Northumbria uh, uh, on, on, on the right. And, and that's quite striking that because some of those differences correspond to some of the early kingdoms that were established after the Romans left. The kingdom of Reged in West Yorkshire and of Elmet and the kingdoms of Northumbria and Brescia. Um, and of course, you you have Gwyneth and Diffid as separate, representing the differences between North and South Wales. So you're beginning to see how this there is a real genetic structure here. These differences are small, but they're very they're significant. They're enough to tell that things are different. And in fact, in some cases, they're really enough to tell us that we made a mistake in placing somewhere. So we had someone who we had down as coming from Blackburn. Now being brought up in Manchester, I knew that Blackburn was just north of Manchester. But this person came from somewhere up near Newcastle, didn't figure. Well, it turns out <coughs> that there's a Blackburn up in the north there, and this person came from there, and it was a clerical error. And the genetics had told us where that person came from in the UK, which is a, a remarkable thing. That Although the differences are small, they can tell you a lot about where people came from. And this is all done in people where we've tried to keep them as much as possible um, as belonging to where they were born, at least, and where their grandparents were born. We had people coming to us, especially in Orkney, with whole long pedigrees because they were so interested in, in their ancestry. So the question is, where does all this variation come from? What explains this structure? And the obvious place to look is at the surrounding European countries where there must have been input into the British Isles at some point. So we've got to have a look at the, a, a brief history of the people of the British Isles, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with. But the first, first modern human settlers that were early settlers didn't come to the British Isles until after the end of the last ice age, about 12,000 years ago. And at that time, there was a land bridge across the channel. So there was more movement 
from what is now the, the continental Europe to, to the Great Britain. And, and then the next big change was quite some time later, was, you know, more than 6,000 years after the first settlers. And that was the arrival of agriculture, which in this part of the world started more or less in the Middle East, what we call the Fertile Crescent, about 10,000 years ago, but it took about 4,000 years before it came to the British Isles. And then there was another long period, more than 6,000 years, where there were no major invasions of the British. And then when the Romans came and took us over for a while, and then when they left, they left a mess, and then the Saxons came, the Anglo-Saxons, and, and then the Viking migrations, and then the Norman invasion. And we're such a stable country in this country, we've had no major land invasion since 1066 and all that. Now, let's just look at that in a little bit more detail just to see. I mean, the, the initial settlers could have come across, uh, obviously, from somewhere further south, uh, where it was possible to live in the Ice Age. The Ice Age must have covered Britain with ice till practically down to the, what is now the Channel. And so there were gradual movements in there, um, uh, starting, as we said, 12,000 years ago, and then by uh, after 10,000 coming across the Channel. But then uh, nothing until the Roman Empire. And the Roman Empire, really the part of uh, Britain that was mainly dominated was this sort of Eastern and South region, which is very similar to the region that has all those um, red squares that constituted about half of the population we studied. They didn't get very far into uh, the West Coast. They didn't really get much into Wales. And the Hadrian Wall was a bit north of where they got to, and they certainly didn't manage to do anything with the Picts and the Irish. So then what about the next major invasion, which were really the only ones that have had a major impact on the British population? The first was the Anglo-Saxons that came from what's now Denmark and, and the northern coast here. Some of them settled uh, down here. That's why we get what we call the Dane Law. Some of them went uh, along the north French Channel Coast and went to Brittany and there was some influx by sea. By that time, there was quite a lot of um, communication by water across the channel. And then the next big invasion was the Norse, Norse Vikings. They were the ones, as I mentioned, that uh, had an, an earldom in Orkney, uh, also, of course, in, in Shetland, uh, and generally dominated the <coughs> north and then the west of Scotland. They came down a little bit. Um, they came down a little bit in, uh, into parts of Ireland, and then the Danes. Uh, another invasion from the same area where the Anglo-Saxons came from. So hard to distinguish them, uh, and they settled in the Dane Law, which is represented by uh, lots of Danish names, and and actually Normandy. And the Normans were Vikings. William the Conqueror was a Viking. It's important to to remember that. Uh, and you get uh, Wessex. You get these. Uh, and you started getting these um, sort of local kingdoms that, that, that split the country up after the Romans came. And as I mentioned, corresponded to some extent uh, to the genetic variation that we found. So <clears throat> um, what can we do about relating that to the European population? Well, the way we did that is to say, well, what can we find out the, about the European countries that surround Britain? and how they might have contributed to this makeup. So we were fortunate enough to be able to do a study uh, on the continent of Europe through a big study done on multiple sclerosis where we got genetic information, not in as great detail geographically, but still uh, enough to be helpful. Um, and we could analyze it in the same way that we did the British. And so you get these sectors. So that's a group of people and each colored sector represents a different one of those clusters, rather like the ones I described, of similar people. And you'll notice that there were some clusters close to the border here, 14, it's labeled 7, 10, 12, 11. There's a little one here called 6, uh, and there's a little one here called 3. And I mentioned those, remember those. Uh, and, and look at some of the differences. North and South Italy vary. Look how, because of the different colors, uh, the, the Denmark is quite different from Sweden, is quite different from, uh, from Norway, is quite different from Sweden, is quite different from Finland. 
Poland is different from Germany. So that shows the variation that you've got throughout the countries of Europe. But what we're now interested in say, how does this variation fit in with what we found in the UK? So there's a simple way to do it, although statistically it takes a bit of doing. And that's, you could say, well, let's take all those British clusters and see how could we constitute each British cluster by a mixture of the Europeans. If they came in to the British, they would have contributed to the different parts of the country. How did they contribute? Can we, can we get each of those British clusters to be made up of a sum of the European clusters, represent them as a mixture? And the answer is yes, you can do that. Uh, now, before we do that, let's just remember again the whole business of the variation in Orkney, in Scotland, uh, Northumbria and Cumbria, the variation here, the big group that represents where the Romans were, Devon and Cornwall and Wales, because we're now going to look at each one of those and see how they're made up of a mixture of the continental European populations that we've analyzed. And this is the result. Uh, it just looks like a colorful picture, but it's got extraordinary information about it. So each of those circles is above one of the populations, the in Orkney, here in Scotland, uh, Northern Ireland, the two groups, um, the Northumbria and Cumbria, West Yorkshire, the two uh, three Welsh populations, as it turned out, North and South Penwickshire and North Wales, Devon and Cornwall, and the big Southeast. And for each of those, what we've given you here, the size of the sector corresponds to the proportionate contribution of the population as is defined here. So let's look first at the dark, the dark blue. Um, that, that's all of the Norwegian. Now, if you look at Orkney, it's quite striking. If you look here, you'll see that this is where the most contribution here comes from, that Norwegian one. It's about a quarter of the whole population. It's not all of it, but it's a lot. And as you go down south, you get a reasonable amount, but it's less here. You get a reasonable amount in parts of Ireland. And gradually, as you get down to the south, there's hardly any contribution. And that fits, of course, with the North Viking invasions that came there, settled a bit in Scotland, came down here, and then and gradually petered out. What about some of the others? Now, the most striking difference and really look at this, is between the Welsh and everyone else. Just look at the colours. The Welsh have no red, no pink. It's a big difference. And the constitution of those Welsh is these green things. They're from France, northwest France, west Germany, and then a little bit from Belgium. And that then, we think, represents the most ancient part of the British population, the part that was probably there before any of these later invasions took place. The population that was there when agriculture came to the British Isles um, some uh, 6,000 years, years ago. And then even you get this little bit difference between this and this. You see that that sector and that sector are a bit wider than these. And you know what this, that's that Little England beyond Wales. That's that uh, story uh, ab about Henry the First, who settled Flemish farmers that came from the Flemish countries there, and it's well known that there's a, a, a line called the Landskill line, which tends to separate Pembrokeshire into people who speak English uh, one below and, and Welsh above. So that difference that we're seeing there, which was also seen even by ABO differences, remains a reflection of people who were settled there just not long after William the Conqueror came. But again emphasizes that these populations are not that much variable over all over the place. Now let's look at, at this, this pink and, and, and this yellow here. They're much la uh, larger down there. Where do they come? They come from Belgium, but they also come from North and Northwest Germany. And that is the best representation we have there of the Anglo-Saxon invasions. Again, the estimate is no more than about 
of the genetic makeup of people that are living there is Anglo-Saxon. They didn't just come in and kill everybody off. They came, they made a major impact, and then they also married locally. Maybe some of them came uh, with, with their wives and, and families. But then one of the most interesting differences, which was quite novel, is this big red sign. You'll see that there, 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 there. And it gets larger as you go down here. But where is it not? It's not anywhere in Wales. It's an extraordinary contribution of some peoples that came before the Roman invasion, almost certainly, and settled and spread throughout Great Britain, except for Wales. And that's quite a, a, a new observation and a sort of subdivision that wasn't expected. And uh, Barry Cunliffe, who has a, a notable um, archaeologist and a good friend who's advised us on some of this. He's written an excellent book uh, about the British populations and, and their history in that way. And, and he's pointed out that there was a time when uh, there was a major interaction between the north coast of France and as you move here and the south coast of Britain when they shared a huge amount of culture, and that was before the Romans came. And we think that that really is reflected by that red subgroup that, that, we've, that we've identified. Um, and I, I think that that's, it's remarkable to see how you can fit the genetics together with what the archeology span and the history tell you. Now, I have to tell you, I haven't mentioned Ireland except for Northern Ireland. And the reason is that the Wellcome Trust didn't support research on the Republic of Ireland. So they only gave us money to study Northern Ireland. So some of the data I've shown you is Northern Ireland. So colleagues of mine uh, combined, um, there've been two very nice studies done looking in detail at Ireland, the whole Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland together and see how it relates um, to Great Britain. And so these colleagues of ours and I <coughs> looked, have looked at this. And, and this, the rest of this is a map that's very like the one you've seen of Britain. But what you haven't seen is Ireland. And what you can see here is when they do a similar analysis to the one I've described, how you see this similarity between Northern Ireland and Scotland, and you don't see it to the same extent in the rest of Ireland. So there's no doubt there that uh, the cultural conditions, uh, maybe the religious differences, have created a population in Northern Ireland that is at this level, uh, can be distinguished from Southern Ireland. But of course, within the Republic, you also get differences, that, uh, that people are different there and as different as they are between North and South Wales or between different groups in this country. So Ireland fits into this picture. And of course, Ireland was, was settled after Great Britain and no doubt the original settlers came across and they may have come from there, but of course, uh, there was quite a lot of movement between Northern Ireland and Scotland at, a, a, at different times, which could also account for these similarities. But it's most likely that the initial inhabitants may have come from here. It depends, I mean, how good their seafaring with us was. Now, the, uh, the colleagues um, <coughs> of, uh, uh, who've done this study, they did a similar study to the one I described, but what is the makeup uh, of these populations? If you, if you look uh, in relation to other, other populations of Europe, uh, and you can see here that the purple, for example, represents Norway. And look here, just as we saw, a very large component. So what you see, the, the, the relative size of each of these colors groups reflects the relative contribution uh, from another European country. And this is, this is the amount for Norway. So you can see, as we've shown, it's quite large. Uh, and <clears throat> it's fairly similar to Ireland. So what's new about this picture over the one I've shown you is it includes the Republic of Ireland as well as Northern Ireland. And you can see that the Republic of Ireland has nearly as much Norse admixture as, as does Orkney. So it's quite large. And then when you look at other, other contributions, for instance, Belgium 
uh, which is the <coughs> green, the light green, and uh, blue, which is Denmark. You can see that the English populations have more of that. Uh, Northern Ireland sits in the middle here, and Wales goes a bit more with Ireland. So you can see reproduced uh, the sort of picture that, that I, I showed you, uh, and including the fact that the German contribution is much larger here than here. And, and um, this, this is, I think, is, um, is maybe Sweden, and, that, and then the, the small pink is Finland, and then there's a little bit of Spain everywhere that must have come in quite early. So that's a picture that really concludes, in a way, the picture that we have of, of Ireland and Great Britain. But I want to go into something else now, because we've still got to say something about how some of this arose. And an important contribution is the, the way that agriculture came. So the, we think about the way that agriculture came. And now my colleague, Cavalli Sforza, uh, with, a, with a, a, an anthropologist, archaeologist, Albert Hammond, came up with a very interesting idea that is reflected by this strange diagram. You see these lines at 500 year intervals. What they found is that if they looked at the sum of the genetic information they had at the time, there seemed to be a common gradient of genetic change measured by a significant proportion of the variation overall due to the European differences that was associated with what looked like an admixture of people from here and, and people from here. Uh, and it looked and they suggested with good evidence that maybe this actually reflected the fact that when agriculture came from the Middle East, it was not just by word of mouth, but it was actually agriculturalists who were moving from area very slowly at one time, a kilometer a year at most, uh, or even less than that, very slowly. And as they moved, they were the same people next to the ones that had not yet developed agriculture. They intermarried and they created a gradual gradient of these changes in gene frequency that matches what you see here. And uh, Luca and his colleagues called it a wave of advance uh, of, <coughs> of, of, the, of the genetic structure, uh, which is quite striking. And one should realize that it, it, in many ways, it might reflect the way that migration often happens. It's not just a sudden influx of people, which it was to some extent with the Anglo-Saxons or the Norman, but it's a gradual influx, maybe more like that group that I was mentioning that, uh, with the relationship between um, the, the northern coast of, of France and the south coast English uh, Channel uh, coast. So the question is, uh, what does that tell us about the influence of agriculture in that way coming um, to the British Isles? Well, <clears throat> this is a diagram from a, an interesting paper by Hakatau that illustrates the different ways that things might have happened. There's a knowledge that there's quite a lot of um, agriculture, of course, came from the Fertile Crescent, uh, from the Anatolian area where there's some of the earliest agriculture. And there's a, there's a thought that the Indo-European languages also came through that way. But then there were other sources. There's a thought that some of the agriculture, when it had moved over here, actually came from the Aegean coast and came up uh, the Atlantic coast of, of Portugal and there. And then people came across by boat and some of them maybe came to Britain here. And then there's a culture that's called the beaker culture that came from somewhere here. That, and the beakers are because they brought a certain type of earthenware. They came much later, 2500 BC. Uh, the agriculture came about 400. But I think the point I would make mostly from this is most of this input here probably had very little influence on the genetic makeup of the British population. Uh, if you think about <coughs> elite groups like the Normans, they didn't leave much of their ancestry behind. You don't see evidence of it, or of the Romans. And, and although there might have been a small number of agriculturalists who came and settled and contributed to the dispersion of agriculture, 
it was probably quite a small number, had very little influence on their, on their genetics. Uh, and, and indeed, there's evidence that agriculture spread throughout uh, Great Britain at an enormous speed from top to bottom in only about 150 years, which is extraordinary uh, when you think about it. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about a bit is what can we say about how this might relate to what we might find out by looking at the DNA of ancient people. You can look at the DNA of ancient people now that is taken from graves, from skeletons, and you can do a remarkable amount of a genetic analysis, although it's not nearly as good a quality. And of course, you don't get huge numbers of people of that sort. And the question is, how does that uh, relate to what we know and what I've been talking to you about um, <clears throat> in, in terms of the genetic makeup of those people compared to what we see now. Well, there are two notable recent papers that claim something extraordinary. They said that there was a Neolithic group that arrived about 4000 BC, that's about the beginning of when agriculture came, that had genetic aff affinities with the Iberian, with the Spanish peninsula. Those could be the Aegean farmers that came around there. And they claim that their data suggested that those people who came and brought agriculture actually came and completely wiped out and overtook the people who were already in the British Isles. And then they say there's another group, the Beaker people, who are those that came from, the, from uh, more in the steppe countries and, and brought the earthenware stuff about 2500 BC. Remember, that's only uh, well, I mean, not much more than a, a thousand years after the previous, and that they again replaced 90% of the British gene pool. Well, I think those are extraordinary claims. And I want to say that I frankly don't think their interpretation is, is right. I think it's very hard to believe that you could have major population replacement in that way. The population replacement depends on the proportion of immigrants to the existing population. It depends on how rapidly they reproduce themselves compared to the existing. And of course, it depends on whether you kill off most of the people that were there. Well, that's unlikely. I mean, of course, if you take the invasion by the British of the Americas and the extent to which they got rid of the local population, that had a huge influence. In, in taking over what is now the, the major part of the American population. But if you go to South America, you still get a major contribution from Native Americans to the population. There was by no means complete replacement. So, I, and, and Barry Cunliffe emphasizes the possibility that there may have been much more movement along the Atlantic side by using boats than people actually realize. And that fits in uh, with a contribution to the development of agriculture from the Aegeans. But actually the way that that fits is with a small group that I didn't point out to you that only arises in Wales and that could represent uh, that small group, uh, namely a few of the farming people that came from the Aegean side and did settle in, in what was the original population of the British Isles before the Roman uh, and, and the uh, Viking and the Anglo-Saxon invasions and represented by the current uh, Western population. Now, <clears throat> there is one, there are one or two examples of uh, good analysis, uh, especially by uh, Laura Cassidy and her colleagues in Ireland, that suggest that maybe they've found some of these ancient um, uh, DNA samples that fit in with existing populations. But there's one study, and it's my last slide, that I want to uh, explain to you in a bit of detail, because I think it throws a very interesting light on this. And it also goes back to why we ever got the money to study POBE, the, the British people of the British Isles Project. Some of you may be aware that there is a major ongoing study of British people at the moment. A half a million people collected throughout the UK through general practice uh, sources. Uh, it's called UK Biobank. It's quite a, a remarkable study, which they're collecting a lot of medical and other information, all with a view to trying to relate it to the genetics 
and use it to find out genetic contributions in a way I described you could do with the HLA variation. And in order to do that, they have to have the characteristics of the normal population with, in which they're comparing these frequencies. And actually, it's for that reason that we got the money for POBE, because in a way, our study was meant to be the control for this big study of British Barbie. So in this British bio, in this study, I think there's something like a thousand or two thousand people that were studied rather the way we did it. But instead of doing our defined analysis, they did just that principal components analysis. Right? So here you can see they found five five groups, five different groups. Uh, it's an orange, a red, blue, purple, green, and brown, all by the same idea that within the groups people are more similar to each other than others. So what do those groups represent? They used our data, they used the POBE samples and said, where would the POBE samples, where would they be placed on this map? And the results are very interesting. So when you take the people from uh, South Wales and North Wales, they fit, I mean, this is not, these are other versions of this same sort of distribution, this one, which is quite striking. They fit, they fit here. So they fit the Welsh that are very different. And when you take these, these others, the English, Northern English and the Irish and the Scottish, they sort of come together here. The, here green is Scotland. Uh, and then the purple is, um, the, the purple is North England. So that's here and that's here. Uh, and the blue is South England. And then you can see a little bit of brown somewhere. You see the brown here, for instance, is Ireland. Okay, so that defines the where what these populations are. So you know, uh, this this uh, the brown. This is Northern Ireland. This is um, uh, this is Scotland. Um, this the purple is is North. This is North and South England, and these are the two Welsh populations. So this group at the same time had access to. Um, to some of these ancient DNA samples. So they did the same thing. They plotted these ancient DNA samples on this map that says, how were those people similar to the people in the British Isles? And here's the map. And there's only one group that stands out, the Anatolian Neolithic farmers. And they seem to be a little different. You can see that they stand out there. But apart from that, and even uh, here, including that, the most striking thing here is that none of these ancient peoples fit in with the Welsh. And I think that's extremely interesting because that says that the Welsh were the British population before the Anglo-Saxons and the Normans came. They were the population that adopted agriculture and they were not much influenced by the incoming genetics. And so all this genetics that reflects these others is probably represented as what was due to the contribution of the Anglo-Saxons and the Norse Vikings to the current British population. So I end up by saying that I think that uh, the way you've got to explain those data when you find some differences between the people you find in burials and the people that you find in the population now it's very well known that many of these burial grounds were really uh, elite people who had buried them in those grounds. They were not necessarily representative of the rest of the population where those graves were found. And so there's quite probably a considerable bias there in that some of the genotypes of those people did not reflect the prevailing type that was in those populations at the time, which would have been the Welsh, the original populations. So I think that's how that's explained. It needs more analysis, it needs more data, it needs more careful comparison. But I think, I hope I've tried to say that you can get a good picture of where the British came from, why the structure of Britain is the way it is, how there's relatively little movement when you stick to the countryside and not the people who move to the cities or who move with the Industrial Revolution, and how you can begin to relate that to the ancient peoples that were there um, even before, but certainly during the time that agriculture came to Britain.
I should, of course, acknowledge the many people who've helped in the basic study of the people of the British Isles, and in particular, the uh, team that I call the Povey team from Oxford, Bruce Whitty, uh, who did a lot of it, Tammy Day, who helped enormously organize things, Stephen Leslie, who was one of the key analysts in it, and the others who took part. And I, I had people from the rest of my lab who had nothing to do with population studies, who loved to come along to our collections, which we did all over the country. And I must particularly mention Peter Donnelly, my senior colleague, who uh, took the responsibility of the data analysis. Um, the other key person in the data analysis, Garrett Hel Helenthal, and the others involved alongside that. And then the two archaeologists who advised us, Barry Cumliffe, uh, whom I've already mentioned, and Mark Robinson. So uh, I owe a great deal, of course, it was an enormous teamwork to get all that information together. So that's my story about the bloodlines of the British. Thank you. We're deeply grateful to Sir Walter for this wonderful overview of his extraordinary study of the bloodlines of the British. He has so elegantly shown us how much we can learn from blood and the value and vital importance of genetic research. Next week, we'll hear from Rose George, a journalist and the author of Nine Pints, A Journey Through the Money, Medicine and Mysteries of Blood. Thank you for joining us today and do please come back online next Friday at this time for another perspective on blood. Thank you. <laughs>